Good morning, and welcome to the Teaching Your Spanish Choir to Sing in Harmony webinar. My name is Estela Garcia Lopez. And I'm Rodolfo Lopez. And uh, we will be joined by our colleagues and friends, Angeline Haurige, Senior Music Editor, as well as Kevin Walsh, Executive Producer of Recordings. Before we get started, for best viewing, close other programs and app or applications. This will improve your viewing and sound quality. If you have any questions, use the question section on your control panel. Questions can be typed in at any time. Answers will be given at the end of the session. For the download handouts, go to the handout section on your control panel to the right and click on the handout to download. And before we begin, we want to mention that for this webinar, we will be using our new publication, our new hymnal, or choral resource called Alabanza Coral. It has over 300 Spanish and bilingual choral arrangements, music for all the major seasons and rites, arrangements that vary from SATB with descant to two or three part harmonies, and a variety of traditional and contemporary musical style styles. It's a very thorough resource. And this choral resource is a support product for our hymnal Flor y Canto and our missals such as Misal del Día, Unidos en Cristo, United in Christ, and today's missal with Spanish insert. And I would like to mention that even though there's 300 songs in, in this wonderful resource, uh, there are other choral arrangements that we were not able to fit in. We have 73 other songs that are available via the web as digital editions. So we invite you to go to our website and look up Alabanza Coral and find what other gems we have there in addition to the 300. And before we begin the webinar, we would like to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning to share information with our brothers and sisters. May everything we say be helpful and help choirs sing more beautifully in your name. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 May we be in instruments of peace. So our very first um, section is called Navigating Through Sheet Music. And if some of you have already started working with your Hispanic choirs, you probably have noticed that most of them are not familiar with scores uh, because of the oral tradition in Hispanic or Spanish-speaking countries. It doesn't mean that not everybody reads music. I know that there are many cathedral choirs in Latin countries that sing beautifully. And, uh, but what we've noticed through the years as we travel through different states we, most of the choir members do not read music because of the oral tradition. So to, before we begin talking about harmonies and everything on the score, we want to share some tips because before they can start singing and navigating through uh, sheet music, it's, it's good to introduce terms to them. What does everything mean? Yeah, it's important to uh, understand that music training in Latin American countries is not readily available. Uh, to the general community. Music training is available to only the communities or the, the, the folks that have the financial independence. So many of the, of the folks who are participating in choirs and ensembles usually learn by rote, meaning they memorize a lot of the music and they learn by repetition. Also, in the United States, many, many of the choirs that, are, that participate in ministry are not aware or do not have the habit of purchasing materials such as hymnals or other types of, of music resources and therefore they rarely get get to be on the same page as far as what resource they will use. This is a great opportunity, uh, Alabanza Coral is a great opportunity to uh, unify the resource of, of the choir so I encourage you to look into it. Um, and again, man, many of the choirs learn by memorizing the music, which, as many of you know, just takes a long time. Trying to get folks to, to 
re to reproduce the music, to regurgitate it from memory is just something that is time consuming and is not necessarily the best because obviously uh, people's memory is, most people's memories is not perfect. And now we're going to navigate to the sheet music, and uh, Rudy's going to talk to us a little bit about terminology and musical symbols. Yeah, it's important to develop a musical vocabulary that is relevant to the skill level of the choir. So therefore, there are key, uh, what I call vital terms in, in the vocabulary. Um, for those of you that are, that are, that your primary language is English, and those and are working with Hispanic choirs, it's important that you develop a a basic vocabulary. You want your choir or the the, the ministers that you work with to have an understanding uh, of what certain basic elements of music mean, and you need to be able to convey to them this information and and be on the same page with them so that they can understand where and how to navigate the music. So for example, um, we have pentagrama, we have the staff. You, uh, getting, the, getting that term uh, into the vocabulary of the ensemble is important. Now, the concept of the staff itself is somewhat very, is, it's complex. So it is important to be able to convey not only what the, the symbol, the graphic is, and what the definition is, but actually how to navigate. So it's important to be able to uh, work with the vocabulary that is connected to the, 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 the staff itself. So for example, compas, which is the, which is the bar or the measure, uh, the beats and pulso. All of these, all of these terms are relevant, and if you are, if you were able to download the glossary of terms, it's all, it's all been placed on in one, in in one uh, PDF, so that you can have that as a reference as you travel down this journey of teaching your choirs. I'm often reminded when I teach music uh, of the famous um, of, of the quote by Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, the quote is that. Uh, evangelize and if you need to use words for me teaching music is the same is it, it works the same teach music and if you need to use words um, you know whatever is at your disposal you you take advantage of any situation use pictures uh, dance dancing is a great way to teach the value of notes so just whatever however you're you're uh, able to connect with the choir and the ensemble, uh, do it. Do not be afraid to go outside of your comfort zone to teach a concept. So one of the PDFs, as Rudy mentioned, is the glossary of, of terminology and music symbols. This glossary is found in Flori, the Floricanto Hymnal, the second edition and the third edition. It's number six, I mean number seven six zero. And you will notice all the terms have been translated into Spanish, and then you have the definition there. We've only pointed out a few of them here, but uh, it would be good for you to study these with your choir so that when you're correcting them or you're telling them where to go, they use the right terminology in Spanish. Now, the, the, the definitions are only in Spanish in this glossary. Um, we, it is our hope that you know what these symbols mean and uh, English definitions for these are more readily accessible. And in Spanish, it's a it was a little more difficult, but we spent the time to put these together for you, and we hope that these are helpful for you. Yes, yesterday I did a search on, on teaching Hispanic choirs on, web, on uh, a web search and found that there was very little. So there is very little information on how to, uh, how to teach a choir uh, prop, uh, how to manage a choir and how to teach them to uh, sing uh, a more uh, in a more uh, organized manner. And uh, we'll go to the next slide where, where you will see some notes and rests and, and how do you say it, you know, what is that whole note, it, how do you say it in Spanish? So it would be a nota redonda, the half note would be a 
nota blanca, or, or if it's a re, silencio de blanca. So this way you learn the Spanish terms, and then they learn them with you. They learn the proper labeling of all these notes. Everything, all of this is gibberish to most Spanish choirs. So they're learning how to read this map. But the, and the more you use these terms, the more familiar they become, and the more comfortable they become using these scores. Yes, um, one of the, one of the um, analogies that I like to use when working with choirs is that uh, nobody is born a musician. We all have to form ourselves to be that. So people will many times look at Stella, myself, Kevin Walsh, Angie Haurigi, and say, wow, you guys were born musicians. It's not true. The fact is that we worked very hard to become uh, what we are and to know what we know. So encourage, be very encouraging to your, to your, choir, to your choirs. Help them to develop confidence so that they themselves can uh, develop the idea that becoming a minister and a disciple of the church is an important is important and therefore requires that you grow as a as a minister, as a music minister and as a uh, disciple. And uh, moving on to the next se section on navigating sheet music, we've uh, gone ahead and added some labels for music sections. Um, so estribillo is is refrain, respuesta is response, estrofas. Um, our verses, you probably know that, but we went ahead and added the article before it so that you could identify it at, in the masculine or feminine uh, correctly. So, el estribillo, la respuesta, las estrofas, el interludio, el puente. So, you're learning the terminology in Spanish, and they're learning, you know, how to read music through you. So, you're both kind of learning together, and uh, I think it's beautiful for both of you to put your part in this um, adventure. So in, in Hispanic music, um, obviously pronunciation and diction is very, very important. The vowels, A, E, I, O, U, they for the most part have a basic sound, unlike the English where you can have different sounds for the A vowel. In Spanish, it's pretty simple. A, E, I, O, U. The challenge here is gonna be helping your choir keep an open sound because they're not used to singing, doing choral singing. They sing more like soloists, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, the challenge here will be um, keeping an open sound and, and, and you will help them master this by repetition and encouragement, constant encouragement. The other, another point that's important is that most Hispanic choirs are made up of members from different ethnic groups, uh, different countries, different Latin American countries. And just like in the United States, in different regions, there are different uh, sort of um, accents in the way that English is spoken. Latin America has also that, that, that situation, that tradition. So um, keep in mind that people will pronounce their words differently. The Cubans will uh, sound different than the Argentinians. The important thing to remember is that you want to work at unifying their sound for your parish. So try to stay away from trying to appease one group or the other because you will be fighting for a long time because everybody believes that the way they pronounce the Spanish is the perfect way. So. So unifying a sound for your parish is what you want to do, and uh, and be be consistent. You know, be 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 open to to who is in your community. Get to know your ensembles. Get to know the ethnicities of your of your groups because that will help you to better understand where they are coming from. Um, you know, uh, pun intended. You know, and and. Uh, you will also be able to get a better sense of how how to better so reach a goal of of allowing them to express themselves and finding a happy medium in how you pronounce the Spanish. So you'll have to agree on whether you're going to say yo, yo, or yo. 
So, you know, you'll have to work together. And you'll have to start practicing those R's, you know, rolling those R's. So there is a handout on one of the PDFs that has a lot of tips on these vowels, how to pronounce them, and, and especially the consonants, because they can be tricky. And there are, are additional consonants in the Spanish dictionary, such as the double L and the double R. And like the Z's, they always sound like S's, never like a Z. It's always an S. And the T's, they're always soft, never explosive. So like, stop. So you can read that handout at your convenience to get more information. And uh, we just want to touch on the elisions a little bit. Uh, in the Spanish language, we, we use elisions a lot, which is combining vowels into one sound. Elisions combine two words vowel sounds and make them into one sound. And then the dip diphthongs are, have different vowel sounds within one word, but they have one sound. And sometimes they have two vowels into one sound, and sometimes it's three vowels into one sound. And it's, I think it's easier than it looks, but initially it, it, it looks really hard. But it's easy for me to say, it's not that hard. No, because I'm Spanish speaking, but it does get easier with practice. So. Cristo ha resucitado, or instead of Cristo ha resucitado, or bueno, or like Uruguay has three vowels, Uruguay, three vowels. So it just takes practice, and that would be a diphthong. So I know you're going to master this, just like the Spanish choirs are going to master reading music. Yes. And now we're going to move on to organizing different voice types in your choir. Before we, uh, I just want to say something about uh, the uh, pronunciation and diction. Um, sing to sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Uh, one of the one of the points of sing to the Lord states that as ministers of music, we need to become fall in love with the sound of the congregation. So, as as a person who's working with a group that is that speaks a language different than the one that we're accustomed to. We need to also fall in love with that. We need to we need to become um, not only familiar but champions of leading this group of of Spanish speakers. You must fall in love with that sound. You cannot it cannot be a chore for you. Um, once you once you're able to um, work with you know manage to to your choir then it will be mo much more easy to be able to translate that over to the congregation. So again, you must fall in love with that sound. For me, personally, Spanish is the most beautiful language in the world. Of course. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the different voice types. Um, for the most part, as you begin working with Spanish choirs, most choir members have no idea what their voice is. Uh, most Female singers think they're altos because they've never really explored the head voice. So it, it, it will take some time for them to figure out what their voice is. Uh, so for example, the soprano voice, it's the higher range um, of the choir. They sing the upper notes, it's a thin voice. So for example, Angie will sing a few notes just to demonstrate the soprano sound. She'll sing un niño. And, uh, and I will sing the alto line, which is a little lower, thicker, and it goes like this. So it's richer, darker, thicker. And then the tenor voice is a, a little, the higher range of the um, male voices. So they all have unique characteristics. And now let's hear the baritone sound. And they all have richness and beauty. And um, typically, the soprano sings the melody. But sometimes the altos will, will sing the melody, or the tenors, or baritones, which uh, you will hear a little later. One of the one of the quotes that has impacted me all my life has been 
uh, I think it was, uh, I want to say it was Plato said, no, the, the, one of the most important things as a human being is to know thyself. I, I equate this in music to knowing myself as a musician. I need to understand my voice. I need to understand the range. Um, when I started singing, uh, I knew I was given a gift to sing. I could, I could mimic pitch. I could, I could uh, also uh, express emotion through music. But I did not know my voice. I did not know my voice. I, I struggled initially as a child. Um, I, I, I struggled. But as I went further in this journey of, of music, I began to understand my voice, my voice type. And one day somebody said, hey, you're a tenor. And it took some time for me to accept that. But once I accepted it, I began to uh, participate in this community of, of tenors. And it has been a wonderful, wonderful journey. I have been uh, surrounded by people who have similar voice types like myself and have been able to learn from them and grow. But also, I have been able to, be, uh, to form a community with, with baritones and basses, and that presented another challenge, and it, it's been a wonderful experience to be able to know my voice and to be able to apply my 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 understanding of my voice to music ministry but it's a process and uh, the all I can tell you is to have patience and be consistent in working with your choirs um, as I mentioned earlier one of the challenges uh, you'll find with your choir is that um, many of the ladies because they don't have very much training especially in their head voice they'll want to sing everything in chest voice and uh, let me just demonstrate a little bit uh, the difference between head voice and chest voice so chest voice uh, you you it would sound like this um, so you're raising that chest voice and it sounds tense and, and it, 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 um, it, it makes your vocal cords work harder and tired. And sometimes it's hard to keep in tune. And maybe you kick in the vibrato and maybe it's too loud. But if you use the head voice, then it's... So it's using the upper range, which does not hurt your vocal cords. And it's more in tune and it's less explosive, and it blends with the choir better. So teaching the difference with your choir, it will be very instrumental, and it's not gonna be from one day to the next, it's a process, but it will happen, I promise you. One of the things that's important to understand as well is, is that the Hispanic communities, most of the countries were colonized by, by countries that are near the Mediterranean or south of the Mediterranean. And in these countries, uh, they celebrate the, up, the upper register of the voice, the, the chest voice sound. Uh, in, in, in many Latin American countries, the higher you can sing, the more macho you are. So, so our you see music- see mariachi music, you are a star. That's right. And so, therefore, um, many of us mimic our musical heroes. And those musical heroes of Latin America, many of them have, you know, sing with this chest voice as very high. I mean, obviously they are gifted and, and well-trained and can, and can manage that sound, but not everybody can. So it's very important to understand that difference between head voice and chest voice. And another thing that, that is important is to understand the vibrato, using vibrato, and the straight tone. So as we mimic our heroes, we hear their vibrato and we mimic that. We, it, it, it is an element that excites us and, give, and is very emotive to us um, and we try to emulate it. So I will give you a little sample of singing with vibrato or what, what is also called modulation. Uh, it, it's, it is the quick, uh, the rapid movement of the voice um, a, uh, which uh, sounds like it's moving up and down. So here's with vibrato. Un 
Señor nos ha nacido. I'm obviously exaggerating. Here is with straight tone. Un niño nos ha nacido. Okay. Singing in straight with straight tone requires much more care. You must be much, it's much more delicate. But many times to sing in harmony, it's important to be able to reproduce that straight tone to create the chords, the, 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 the harmonies with the vocal cord, with the, with the chords in the music. And so it's, it's important to remind your choir when it is appropriate to sing like a soloist. If they're singing a solo verse, it's okay. But when they're singing as a choir, then they always have to use that head voice so that you can unify the sound. I did want to mention that if you work with children's choirs and youth choirs, um, that's wonderful. It's, it's better to instill good habits when they're young than to work with adults that have been singing it the wrong way for a very, very long time. We've learned that through the years. And now that we've been working with children's choirs and youth choirs, it has become easier when they transition to the adult choir. So don't, don't lose hope. You can do this. It's going to be great. One more element to, or one more point to talk about is the concept of singing in the choir uh, because you feel you were given this desire, the God placed the desire for you to sing, and therefore it is your right to sing. I, I do not disagree with the right to sing at church. It is, it is everybody's right to participate uh, with their voice and especially when they sing. However, sometimes the desire outmatches the skill. And we have to be careful that we, we work towards bringing those two things together. So in other words, if somebody uh, may have this great desire to sing and say, I sing because God gave me this desire to sing. Um, okay. The fact of the matter is that we as musicians are, are organizing sound. And if your sound, because of, of your desire to sing, is not, being, is not conducive to good choir singing, then you need to change your attitude. Yes, God gave you a desire to sing but you need to work on uh, becoming part of the sound of the choir and then part of the sound of the congregation and then part of the sound of the whole sound of the musical life of the parish. So we're going to move on to um, the melody and the harmony, uh, the importance of each of them and, and what role they each have. Yes, melody. Melody, it's a term that we've used, um, that, we, that we're familiar with, but many of us do not understand how it's used in music. Melody is the sequence of notes that, are, that give a piece of music its identity. It is the musical idea or the musical notes that, uh, that I, I like to call it, they belong to the congregation. The congregation uh, is is uh, this is the piece of mu the the musical idea that belongs to them? They sing it. Therefore, we need to protect it. We need to emphasize it. It's important that 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 the melody be always robust and clear. And the harmony should never dominate the melody. So the harmony is an ornament for the melody. So that's. It's, it's good to instill that in your choir because you may have a bunch of tenors that love to sing like Vicente Fernandez, mariachi singing, but they need to remember that the melody is the most important thing. And, uh, and the other thing, now we're moving on to the next slide, yes. Um, if, if um, to get a better success for your beginning choir, it's, it's always a good idea to position singers strategically. So, so even though you have the best singer, your best singers are probably sopranos maybe, or tenors. If, if you have a lot of sopranos, but you don't have any altos that can really carry a harmony, then it might be good for you to position a soprano to sing alto, you know, as a section leader for a while, so that the others master that skill, develop their ear level. And 
Yeah, and it's important that the concept of independence, sing, singing in, uh, independently, be um, brought to the choir and practiced uh, as a skill. Um, if, if you're intending to sing in harmony, you need to develop the ability to sing independently. Now this is a mystery. This, you know, we, we, it's, it's, it's not something that you can buy at the store or something you can learn in college. Um, this is something that, that is within ourselves. The ability to sing with independence uh, can be uh, learned, but it is something that I believe is, is a God-given gift. So if you have somebody who does cannot sing independently, you need to work with them so that they can keep growing and, and hopefully someday understand and, and be able to sing independently from other parts. And now uh, we're going to move on to um, the different styles of harmony, which is probably what you were hoping we would get to um, first. Uh, but we needed to give you some tips on how to work with beginning Spanish choirs. We felt that that was really important. Now in the PDFs that you received, you, you got some music that we will be looking at shortly. Um, and But before we begin, um, we would like to talk a little bit about the different styles of harmonies. Uh, Rudy's going to talk a little bit about the more traditional SATB. Yeah, this style of singing is called homophonic. And basically what it, what it is is that all the parts in the music move simultaneously. They don't move in the same direction, but they all tend to have the same rhythm. Um, so, and they usually consist of the SATV. A, this is a tradition that has long been established uh, in, in Europe and came to the Americas and, and took root in many of the Latin American countries. So there's a great tradition of, of, of this type of singing, um, uh, but uh, it, is, it is, you do need to have uh, capable and you need to have all of the parts represented. So now I invite you to pull out the Un Niño Nos Ha Nacido PDF. It's song number 82 in, in, the, in the PDFs. And um, in Alabanza Coral, for the standard SATB harmonies, we did not include labels. So this, because it is a standard SATB, you will not see any labels. But if it differs from that, we've included uh, specific labels and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So for now, why don't we sing Un Niño Nos Ha Nacido. So as we said earlier, uh, we have Angeline singing soprano and Kevin singing baritone and Rudy will be singing tenor and I will be singing alto. So I invite you all to follow whatever voice is yours. Uh, harmonies, which is the um, 
counter harmonies. So in Alabanza Coral, you'll see an array of different styles. And now Rudy will talk a little bit about it. Yes, um, this is what we call polyphonic singing, which means that there are two or sometimes even more musical ideas happening within a section. So for example, uh, we some, some choir, part of the choir will sing the melody and another section of the choir will respond or echo. Um, this is also a very traditional form of choral singing that has a, its roots in Europe. So if I invite you now to open up uh, the PDF for Agua Pura, it is song number 152. Now this, this piece is probably a little more challenging um, and uh, you may need to grow this piece uh, through a process of time. You may want to start with the melody and then maybe add one of the harmonies, maybe the alto, which is probably closer to the, harm, to the melody, and then add the second soprano, and then lastly add the uh, soprano one. For now, we, we uh, Kevin and Rudy are going to sing the melody, which is in the baritone line. I will sing the contralto part, and Angie will sing the soprano two. And if any of you out there want to sing soprano go soprano one, go for it. So here we go. We're going to sing the refrain, and then verse one. I think we're going to divide our voices. Uh, the ladies, we're going to sing verse one. Angie will sing the upper line, and I will sing the lower harmony. So ladies, sing with us. <laughs> specific phrasing. What is phrasing? Uh, phrasing is the musical idea. So in other words, you sing a line, you do not break the line. You, you break it or take a breath after that phrase. And in this particular piece, it's, it, they have two types of, of phrase marks. On system two, they have the line that connects several notes. Uh, and in that same system, on, in the baritone part, on the first beat, you have a phrase mark that looks like a comma. Uh, that is also a phrase mark. So these are important elements to understand and to be able to add to your vocabulary of music. And we are gonna move, move along, because I know we're running out of time, and we wanna make sure that you have time for questions. Uh, we also, in Alabanza Coral, 
we included contemporary harmonies as well. And uh, you'll notice that in the labeling, you'll see a melody label and then a harmony label. And sometimes it's hard to determine who sings what when you say just harmony one and harmony two. So we're gonna invite you now to turn to uh, song number 113, A la Muerte de Roto. And uh, we're gonna sing through one of those contemporary songs. And this particular song is by Santiago Fernandez. I don't know if we have any fans out there of Santiago's music, but this is an example of a contemporary song where uh, you have a melody and then harmonia below. So in this case, because of the range, um, I'm going to sing the upper harmony and then tenors uh, and baritones will sing the lower harmony. Oh no, baritones are going to sing the melody along with the so, uh, sopranos. So we're going to try that and uh, see how it works. And the first time we'll sing it in unison and then on the repeat we'll, we'll jump into the harmonies. And uh, on the verses, we're going to do one verse. Uh, the men will sing the upper melody line, and then the ladies, we will sing the lower harmony line. So let's do this. <laughs> This particular song has a descant, and, uh, and you also have that harmony one and harmony two. Um, so for now, why don't we have uh, barit uh, tenor and baritone sing the lower harmony. I'll sing the first harmony, so they'll sing harmony two, I'll sing harmony one, and then and Angie will sing the melody on the first pass. And then we'll sing the refrain one more time, and uh, Rudy will jump up to the harmony one because of the range. It still fits within the tenor voice, so he can jump to the harmony one, and I'll jump into the tenor. Okay, so let's try that. And, uh, are you singing now? and we're going to sing in Spanish. I'll sing the descant the second time we sing it. Right, right. Uh, one, one thing to point out that uh, this style of, of choral singing is one that is uh, designed to include a, a counter melody that's intended to sound like it's improvised. Although the music is for the 
for the desk hands is written out, it, it's still, we're trying to convey the concept of just improvised uh, music. 